Okay, um, this is the overview. It actually doesn't match up with my slides very well. So a little bit of background on GSM so you guys are kind of up to speed on what's happening. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, base station and then baseband stuff and then a the conclusion. Actually, yeah, it's, ignore that slide. It's wrong. Okay. So the GSM protocol is absolutely fucking huge. Um, it's made up in dozens and dozens of documentation. Like there are these thousand page PDFs that you have to read. So uh, for example, to understand the L1 layer, which is the uh, radio encoding layer, you have to read a 500 page document called GSM 0508. Uh, if you want to understand how uh, the L3, the actual application layer works, you have to read uh, GSM 0408, which describes the application layer. You have to read a separate GSM document which describes how the uh, structure formats are defined, and then another one that describes how the definition of the structure formats are encoded. Right? So you need to read three documents just to understand it. Or, or you could do what I did and cheat and just read the source code to uh, GSM implementations as, as well as 0408. Um, so basically, if you're getting into GSM, you can skip most of it and just do 0408. It's the simplest one. Uh, it helps if you have an understanding of telephony to begin with, um, how it's set up with basically signaling and data layers. But anyway, so at the lowest level of GSM, the, the actual RF part, uh, I stole all of these pictures from Wikipedia, by the way. So uh, like my, my art isn't anywhere near this good. Um, basically, the important thing to take away from this is that GSM is based on TDMA, which is time, divis time division multiple access. So it's all based on clock timings. Um, the stream of bits in the air is actually decoded based on time. So you have to sync the, the clock in your phone to the clock in the base station correctly in order for you to be able to interpret the bits back and forth. Um, the important thing here is that there's actually only a very, very small amount of data per time slice, per time slot. So uh, each of these things is called TS for time slot. There's TS0 through TS7, so there's eight of them. Uh, you pack them together and you have a frame. So eight time slots is one frame. You pack those together, you can either have 26 or 50. Uh, sorry, it's, so basically you have 27 or 51 of them in total, and those are called multi frames. You add multi frames together, you get uh, super frames, which take six seconds to transmit. And then you uh, add super frames together and you get hyper frames, which take three hours, like three and a half hours to transmit. So. The uh, hyperframe is important for A5, which I'm not going to talk about because I don't care about it. Um, but basically, the, hyper, your, the frame position within the hyperframe is used as part of the encryption uh, input. So uh, that's, that's important for A5 stuff, but not for us. Um, essentially, each of these time slots has 23 bytes of information. So when we do our fuzzing attacks, when we're trying to fuzz the phone, we only have 23 bytes to play with. So we could actually do a complete exhaustion of all of the possible combinations in a very, very short space of time. It takes us, I think, three days to run through a complete exhaustion of just one channel. Right? OK. Um, so we have these three layers that go into GSM. Uh, everything in GSM is con like it's compacted into just sets of initials. So uh, the layers are called very creatively L1, L2, and L3. Uh, sometimes you'll see the abbreviation L123, meaning all of them together, or L23, meaning just layer two and three. Um, import one over here. L1, that's the lowest level, as I said before. That's just that's slightly above the radio level. That's literally just how things are encoded in the air at the radio level. It's kind of boring. There's not a lot you can do with it security-wise. If you get it wrong, then the phone just is unable to decode the bits or the, the network equipment is unable to decode the, decode the bits. Like, there's not a lot you can do there. Um, L2 is actually quite thin. It basically determines which of the L3 state machines should receive input from the L1. So L1 decodes or encodes the data, passes it to L2, and L2 looks at it and figures out which part of L3 should handle it. Then L3 contains the application layer stuff and that includes things like uh, CC, MM, and RR, right? So CC is call control. Call control is used very obviously for um, setting up and tearing down uh, telephone calls. And MM is mobility management. It's basically used for authentication. 
and for um, moving from one cell to the next cell. So it deals with basically a, the, the auth part of the GSM stack. And then RR is radio resource, and it's used for dealing with uh, opening channels and closing channels and so on. So those three things, CC, MM, RR, L123. Like we've got tons of these, so everyone should keep up, right? Um, then we need to look at the sorts of channels that you have. So as I said, like you've got these time slices. Each time slice will be assigned to a channel, typically. So uh, for instance, C0, TS0 is channel 0, time slot 0. That's the uh, BCCH. It's the broadcast. So if we go through these quickly, you'll see that we've got BCCH, which is the broadcast control channel, FCCH, which is the uh, frequency correction channel, SCH, which is the synchronization channel, and the CBCH, um, which is cell broadcast channel. Basically, BCCH pours out all the information about a cell. So if you're using a, uh, if you have a BlackBerry and you have it set up for the engineering screen, I, uh, everyone's done that, right? You can, you can hack your Blackberries and like get engineering tools. Uh, if you do that, it will have a screen which lists things like all of the avail available ARFCNs, the available cells, and uh, several of the timers and so on. All of that information is sent over the BCCH and sent as system information messages. So there's SI1, SI2, SI3, SI4, 5, 6, 7, 8, up through 16, but only 1 through 4 are important. And once again, we're not going to deal with those specifically. Um, so all of these are basically broadcast channels. They're unidirectional. They only go down from the network side to the phone. Okay, so there's the downlink from the network to the phone and the uplink from the phone to the network. Uh, most of the attacks we're going to be looking at today are uplinks, so they're from the phone to the network. They're much more interesting. All right, then we have control channels. Okay, these are actually useful for us. Um, so there's the paging channel, the PCH. The paging channel is used to announce to a phone that there's an incoming SMS or an incoming phone call that it needs to respond to. There's the RACH, the random access channel. RACH is used by the phone to request a channel. So it sends a request up. Um, I'll go into this in a bit more detail. So it sends a request to the network, and the network allocates a channel and sends it back down. It sends it back down on the ACGH, the access grant channel. Right? So these three are actually kind of critical for us to understand GSM. Um, then once you've opened a channel, you're going to get a SDD, SDCCH. It's a standalone dedicated control channel. Um, the particular one that you have isn't really important. What's usually critical is how it gets used on the application side at the back end. So there's uh, fast association and so association, which are based on authentication levels, as I, uh, as I recall. And then uh, this ACCH, I'm not sure what that is. Right. Now, the important thing to remember about a GSM channel is that they are fucking slow. It can take two to three seconds to open a channel. Right? They're not instantaneous because it's all based on time slots. So once you make your request, it can take a while for the back end to have a slot available where it can respond to you again. Right? There can be really, really like huge amounts of time that get wasted in there. That hurts us mostly on the fuzzing side when we're using our base, band, uh, sorry, our base station to fuzz phones because opening a channel can take a long time. Um, it so far hasn't been a huge issue, but it's something to be aware of. Um, and also, there's a lot of channels, right? So everyone's comfortable with that, right? Like the SDCCH, PCH, AGCH, RACH, right? L123. Yeah, we're good to go. Any questions? No? Awesome. OK, so now we're going to look at how a channel is opened. Um, opening a channel is actually fairly straightforward. OK, so the phone makes a request on the RACH. And this request is basically made up of a random 25-bit value. All right, so you can see like this is strong security at work so far. So the random 25-bit value is uh, chosen by the phone. It sends a request to the tower. The tower will find an open channel and put that information in the access grant channel response. And it will send back a response saying, the person who made request 01 now has channel, you know, this time slice, this channel, this frequency, blah, 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 right? So that information comes back. And at that point, the phone can then attempt to make the connection by using that information to transmit, right? So it's 
pretty much asynchronous. The phone makes a request. If it gets a response, then it can then associate on that channel. Right? All good. OK. The other setup is, so that would be if the phone initially wants to make a call itself, if it's trying to contact the network out of nothing. If, on the other hand, there's an incoming message or incoming SMS or an incoming phone call, the tower will broadcast over the uh, PCH. It will broadcast. The person with uh, this ID number has to, like, basically should talk to me and get a channel. So it will send a broadcast out on the PCH. And these are very, very simple. It's a 32-bit value, which is called the TIMSI. It's the Temporary Mobile Subscriber Identifier. And it sends that out. And then the, the phone that has that TIMSI will respond. And it will respond by sending an RACH, right? Gets back on the ACGH. And then you've got an LCH. Yeah? No questions? Awesome. OK. Um, part of the funny stuff that happens with this is, for example, the way that uh, older phones that didn't have a lot of memory and didn't want to like, generate random values or use a tick counter, uh, they would pre-select 32 random values and burn those into the firmware. And then they would just use a pointer to iterate through those 32 values. So that's how they would get the, the random values for this stuff. So you, you do get collisions fairly frequently. Right? I mean, 255 bits is not a lot of space. Right. This is sort of what a typical cell station will look like. Uh, so the BTS is the base station system. Uh, the BSC is the base station controller. And the MST is the mobile switching center. Right? Everyone's got that? No problems. So the MS, or the mobile station, will uh, connect to one of the ARFCNs, which is the absolute radio frequency uh, control number or code number. All right? This isn't too much for anyone, is it? OK, so ARFCN is basically a specific subset of the GSM band that you're using for um, your communications. So of the, the GSM bands, which is like 850, 900, uh, 1800, and 1900, uh, there's actually subsets within that of 200 kilohertz, megahertz, some, some value that's fairly small. And those get paired together. So there's an uplink and a downlink. And then those get divided. So there's 1024 of them in total, going from 0 to 123. And there's a simpler algorithm, algorithm to convert from a ARFCN number to the specific frequency that you're using. And it's basically um, like you add 20 and multiply by, or you multiply by 20 and you add the base value or something like that. It's, it's very, very simple. Pretty much the important takeaway from that is the low values from like 0 through, I think, 256 are GSM 850. 256 to 512 are uh, 900. 512 up into the like, low 800s or so is for 1800. And then there's a, a crossover from 1800 to 900 where like uh, 623, which is, for example, the ARFCM my, my BlackBerry is on right now, 623 is either 1900 or 1800. And unfortunately for the demos over here, it's 1900. So um, as I mentioned, the demos don't work on 1900 band. Um, all right, so that's, that's at the, the actual tower end. So usually they'll have several ARFCNs per uh, BSC. And those ARFCNs have very, very low levels of logic. They're not very sophisticated. All they do is the actual radio encoding and decoding, and they pass all the information back up then the BSC will monitor several of these and use that to send information back up to the MSC. And the MSC will uh, basically keep track of the regional information and then push it back even higher. So the base transceiver station here will talk to the phone. It will basically have an Ethernet connection or sometimes a direct radio link back up to the BSC, or it will be on site. BSC will go back to the MSC and so on. It's Pretty straightforward stuff, right? Um, more interestingly, over here is the MS, which talks to the BSS. Sorry. So all of this together is called the base station subsystem. And the base station subsystem is what we're going to be attacking in the demos that do not work. OK? So the base station subsystem talks to the phone. Um, it's in communication with the MSC. The MSC is in communication with the back end stuff.